You're watching Pegarai TV, Rhode Island's public access channel. Hey, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to another edition of An Hour with Bob. Guess what? We're approaching our anniversary, May 29th, 1992. I began Bob's Big Adventure, and this was a spinoff of Bob's Big Adventure. This show, of course, is called An Hour with Bob. And my guest this early evening or late afternoon, you might want to call it, since we usually do our show at 7.30 at night, but to accommodate some people, I elect to do a show in the afternoon. And with us today is a guy that I got to know as a town administrator, a town manager actually, of Narragansett. But before he was a town manager of Narragansett, he was a state trooper. And before that, he was a secret service agent. And now he's back to being a state trooper. And now he's the colonel of the entire state troopers in Rhode Island. And that's James, Colonel James Manny. How you doing? Nice to see you, Bob. Nice to see you. This is very interesting that I met you when I was working with the lieutenant governor at when you were the town manager, manager yes. of Narragansett. That's right. But you and told me you met me. On a block on a ferry like 28 years ago. That's crazy. It is. So I remembered you. You don't remember me. But you were like a, a you made secret such, service You agent. made such an impression on me. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did I put you on camera? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Are you on camera? I, I don't think so, but you asked me if I wanted to go on camera. Oh, all right. Then, yeah, that's what yeah. I, I would have covered yeah. the belt. I would have covered myself on You would have, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. But you, you grew up in where? Cranston. Cranston, Rhode Island. Yes. So you're a Rhode Islander. True Rhode Islander. True Rhode Islander. Born and bred. Now, how did you end up, was your first job in, in law enforcement, secret service? Is that what, was that your first job? Um, it was close, so I, I, I started, I went, grew up in Cranston, went to the public schools, went to the University of Rhode Island, got a bachelor's, went to, got, went to Bryant, got a master's. Wow. Then I went in the IRS criminal investigation division <clears throat> first. Oh, that, oh, that was a lovely yeah, that uh, was, that was department a, that to was, That was an interesting job. That was out of Boston. Then yeah. I went in the United States Secret Service, New York field office. But an interesting fact. Now, wait a minute, did you have to move to New York? Yes. But another interesting fact, while I was in college, 1981, 82, 83, I was on the Rhode Island Park Police on the summers, and Hugh, Hugh Clements, Chief Hugh Clements, of was, my, was my boss. My really? first boss, yes. Wow. Yeah. So uh, That is interesting. I've known Chief Clements for a long time. In fact, last week, we had, we had uh, the former colonel, of the, well, one of the former colonels of the state police on this very show, uh, Steve O'Donnell. Right. And it's uh, uh, amazing that there were, what, Six years still around? Or five former? Yeah, there's 14. Th in the history of the state police, 94 years, there's been 14 superintendents. Only 14? Yeah, only 14, right. That, that's pretty amazing in itself. It is. Well, Colonel Stone was on for forever. For 30 years. So yeah. He, yeah, yeah. He, he, he threw the curve off. <laughs> he sure did. He sure did. And when he was there, it was a whole different world. It, uh, it was back uh, when I was a kid, and I was going to uh, go to be a lawyer, and a constitutional lawyer, and he was of the... Of the the mindset he reminded me of um, um, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar, that's what he reminded so me. So he was the superintendent, 1959 to 1990. Right, right. He was, he was, you know, he was very. He was in law enforcement almost 60 years mm. total. He was on the province. Charismatic team. guy. He was, uh, you know, he was a very old school guy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when he said something. People listened. He did. He had a lot of power. He had he that. Did. He, when he walked in the room, you knew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He sure did. He did. Well, you, so you've been in law enforcement since. What year? 
I would say full-time law enforcement in 1984, and you know, I was in 1981, 82, 83 in part-time law enforcement. Now, when you say, what did you do with Secret Service? Well, I was a special agent in Secret Service, so I was at an investigative field office, 200 agents out of New York, but I was also filling in on protective details, President of the United States, Vice President, wow. dignitaries, the Queen of England, King Hussein, stuff like that. Oh, nothing. You're just blowing it off like it's mine, minor league. Uh, that's all major stuff. Well, that's what every that's, one of them you're talking about. But that's that's what those that's what special agents do in that job. Anything stand out? Anyone in particular stand out? Any uh, incident or person stand out? Well, to you? there were several. Um, the w there were two very memorable people. Many memorable people protectees. But one was President Reagan. I spent um, almost a month with him at his ranch in California. Oh, that's not bad detail. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was interesting. There were, you know, several, a lot of agents there with him, and um, that was very interesting to see the president in that element. You know, watching history be made. And then another great man was uh, President Bush. Um, uh, the first Bush. George Herbert Walker Bush. Right. Yes, a tremendous right. individual. Well, he was a former CIA director. That's right? correct. Yep. He was. A, he was. He had a very nice family and. Uh, he was a great man. From from Connecticut originally, right? From Connecticut, then he moved to Texas, and then obviously Washington. Right. But it's amazing that you had uh, a job like that. that it was. I, 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 sometimes I watch the History Channel and I see some of the places I was at with them, and yeah. it's pretty interesting to see that. Yeah, cause, uh, and I was recruited out of Roger Williams College at the time for the uh, FBI. But wow. At, to go to Washington, but I was married. They were paying nothing. They were paying $9,500 a year and, uh, I don't know, $45 a, a week expense money or some ridiculous number like that. Yeah, well, the wages were pretty low back then. Yeah, you, oh, that, yeah. 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 It wasn't that far. Yeah. <laughs> no, 19, it was. 1948? Is yeah, that what you said? Like that. No, no, that's, like, just my, just, that's my just birthday, year, I'm just teasing. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what? Well, what did it feel like going back after leaving? How long were you in the state police? That's, oh, by the way, after you left the Secret Service, you went on to the state police? That's correct, yes. I, so and that was in what year? 1990. So I went June 17th, 1990. Right. I was uh, admitted to the Brown State Police Academy, State Police Academy in Foster. And um, I, I stayed till June 17th, 2015. So 25 years to the day. The wow. last hour of the last day. Then I had mandatory retirement. I was going to say that. That's why you retired, right? It was. I would have stayed there forever. It right. Was, so I had mandatory retirement, and everyone does except, Ex the, super, except say, the superintendent. Ex right. Because they're right. appointed by the governor. And um, I was, then I, I worked, uh, when I retired from the state police, I became a director at the Turnpike and Bridge Authority for a year. And then the opening came up with the Narragansett, town of Narragansett as the uh, town, manager. town manager. About two years and seven months I stayed there. It was a great experience. Right. I can remember having breakfast with at you Melgy's. at Melgy's. That's right. Yeah. Who were the other guys there? Who's the, who were the other? I mean, some well, of the other well, guys. the lieutenant governor was there, and um, I don't, I don't remember who else was there. I just remember was you that? and the lieutenant governor. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, the owner, the owner. Oh, was the owner there. was there. The owner was there. Who drive? Who drove, drove that uh, Cadillac convertible? The blue Cadillac convertible. It was out in the, it was out in the driveway. I there. don't remember that. But, yeah. Uh, I remember I had an omelet that day. I, don't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got pictures still. Yeah, I have yeah, pictures. Yeah, you do. Anyway, you're 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 making some some changes. And what what are some of the initiatives you're you're so up, I, I up came, to? So the governor uh, after the election, uh, the governor uh, I was approached by the governor's office, asked if I was interested in becoming the superintendent. And was, was that a shock? It was. I never thought I'd be going back after I retired. But they approached you? Uh, yes, they asked me if I was interested. Wow. And, and um, it, it was a tremendous opportunity. Sure. So, as much as I loved being the town manager in Narragansett, right. it's a tremendous opportunity, and I jumped at it to go back as the superintendent of the state police. Yeah, because as you say, as you point out, you couldn't be a trooper more than 25 That's years. That's correct. Other than the superintendent was also called the colonel. That's right. Um, that was the only shot to do that. It That's right. That. It would never would have come up again. That's a hell of a uh, compliment to be... Ask well, that. Well, it's an honor. An it's honor, an more honor, than that. Tremendous. Yeah. It's an honor to be even considered for that, never mind chosen for that position. Right, right. It's a great organization. So, so yeah, so what was your question? Well, some of the initiatives that you're, uh, what do you, what do you, when you first got in there, you had to say, well, this is what I want to do, or this, this is what I'd like to do, this is what I don't like. Some of the changes, some of the initiatives, some of the so things the state, you want to do. So, the state police is a well run organization, tradition based. You know, we wear very traditional uniforms. 
but every superintendent has a vision of right. where they see the state police going. Sure. And, and you know, the state police has a its its major function, really two major functions are uh, uh, well, public safety for the whole state, as it relates to the uniform division and the detective division, detective. In, investigations. Right. So highway safety, safety amongst um, uh, secondary roads, you know, that's a priority of the state police, one of the priorities. So that was one of the initiatives that um, I, I started looking into, is, is the safety of the troopers, looking at the resources I had and, and where I wanted them to be. Right. So we, we ride two troopers to a car at night. Um, with, there are seven cruisers on the road at night only. A lot of people think there's a lot of cruisers on the road. They seem to be. They seem to be. <laughs> but there's really only seven at night, right. from nine at night till eight in the morning. So we're looking into putting 16 cars on the road with single troopers in each car. Right. But it has to be safe. There has to, you know, yeah, safety for the troopers is paramount at night. Right, right. So, so that's one initiative we're looking at. Another one is now. Why did they switch off? And anyway, didn't didn't it used to be that way a long no, time ago? No, historically, it's always been two it's to always a, been two, two to a car. But you know, there's many dangers law enforcement has, especially state troopers. And, yes. Uh, the traffic accidents are a major concern. Traffic safety for the troopers. Oh, you so, see it on YouTube all the time. Mm, a trooper getting nailed or almost that's right. hit and whatever. Well, in the month of uh, March, uh, month of April. There were four state troopers across the United States that were killed in motor vehicle crash. Wow. One in Maine, right? two in Illinois, and one in California, all within a span of a week or a week and a half. Wow. And, you know, I went to the funeral for the one in Maine, and very sad. So the, the, the safety of the troopers on the road when they're conducting their business, their work, is, is a major concern. So we're trying to put more vehicles on the road, and we're going we're gonna to test it out. We're going to try it and see if it works for the state police. Single lay patrol, single man car right, at right. night. Well, what are the normal shifts of state police? There's two shifts, 8 in the morning till 9 at night. And 8 nine, in the morning till 9, that's 13 right. hours. 13 hour days, 11 hour nights. Wow. So there's two shifts. So troopers work a lot of hours. Really? Yes. So the weekly? They work three days on, three off. Okay. So, you know, a 13-hour shift's a long time, an 11-hour night's a very long time yes. to, to, you know, to be on your yeah. toes, stay awake, uh, be vigilant. So we're looking, we're going to try and look at a, a, a balance of safety and coverage for the state. So that's one of the initiatives. Another initiative that we're looking at is an impaired driving unit. Um, yeah, that we, would, yeah. For DUIs, marijuana, um, uh, distracted driving, cell phones. Um, now, presently, what are they giving for... Uh, you catch somebody texting. Is it a, it's a warning it's, or a ticket? It's a ticket. It's a it's a summons, and I believe the fine's eighty five dollars. Uh, but it's a summons to the traffic court if you don't want to pay it. If you want to contest it, but distracted driving is a huge issue across the United States, not yes. just in Rhode Island. I look at some of the stats of uh, looking down for one second at sixty miles That's an right. hour, and you know all the the distance you travel more than the football field. And you and you you don't have it doesn't have to be scientific. Just go on the road and look. Everyone's holding their phones and texting. They're at a stoplight and they pull it out and they're right, texting. Right. We're, we're addicted to our phones, all of us. So um, it that's that's an issue. They estimate maybe nearly forty to sixty percent of all accidents are caused from distracted driving, cell phones. And that's just as bad as drunk driving or impaired it, driving. It, it, it's as bad. Yes, it's, it, they're all a concern. Sure. So we, we, we're, we're researching getting federal funds through the Rhode Island DOT and through the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to fund a unit specifically to enhance the safety of the highways in the state as a core function. Well, that's important. Um, safety is everything. And, and like I said, you see, it, you see it all the time on, yeah. on YouTube. Where yeah. Troopers or cops, but mostly troopers uh, do the highways, right? That's right. Especially that's interstates. That's right. And you see it all the time. You're getting scary. Nailed. Isn't it? Yeah. Oh God, it's. There was it one is. in Florida last week. There was one of a Florida state trooper jumping up on a Jersey barrier. I saw that. I saw that. He was very lucky. He very. He did. Get, he did bro break his ankle. That's too. right. He had an ankle injury. He but very close. To I think crushed. his ankle got crushed. Is what I it think did. happened. It, it did. That's what it looked like. Right. To me. Right. Yeah, I saw that. Very I saw lucky. That. And just to think, just because you got a, a, a light on, doesn't you know, mean, well, it's, especially like you said, people are 
they're texting, they're going along on the highway. They don't expect a, a, a car to be in the in that lane. The safety uh, lights, the uh, uh, they're not bulletproof. You, you, I mean, they you know you still can you still can. Um, when I use that term facetiously, sure. They what I mean is just because you have your lights on, emergency lights doesn't no. mean people are going to stop. Exactly, Anything or even happen, see you. Right. You know, if they're sleeping or half asleep or yeah, or, or like you said, texting or whatever. That's right. They're not going to not going to adhere to you. What, what about um, impaired driving? How can you tell when somebody's like on high on weed? Well, so marijuana, so there's really, uh, the way the state law is written, it's, it's under the influence of an intoxicating liquor and or drugs. So the, the way the state law is written now, it really doesn't matter if they're, you know, obviously by the way they're driving, weaving lane to lane, going too slow, going too fast. There, there were oh, eating a sandwich. <laughs> well, <laughs> Oh, that's be. what they say anyway about marijuana, supposedly. <laughs> it gives you the munchies. <laughs> You're old school, Bob. Um, so, but there, there are ways. Uh, uh, this is very similar to whether someone's intoxicated with liquor or drugs, the, the, the warning signs. And those are observations a police officer or trooper would make on the highway. The testing is different. I was going to say so that. So the better. testing for intoxicating liquor is you have a chemical test. Sure. You have a portable breath test on the road, then you have a chemical test, which is a breathalyzer, that uh, you could get an accurate readout of, of the uh, blood alcohol level. Um, but marijuana, it's a little different. They really haven't developed a test right. that could give you the level of intoxication, impairment. So that's something that you know we're, we're waiting anxiously for in law enforcement. And, and Bob, the, you know, it's... it's it's legal. Marijuana is legal in Massachusetts. Right. So it's stone throw from where we are right now. Exactly. Connecticut is on track to make it legal. So the, the issue is already here. And what do you think about it? Well, I... Personally, I, what do you think about it? Well, I've never tried marijuana in my life. Right. I don't, do not advocate for drug use of right. any type. But uh, when I testified in the Senate and finance, uh, in, in the General Assembly, regarding this bill to legalize marijuana, I'm advocating for the resources that are attached to that bill. Right, right. So that we could get drug recognition experts. We could get the funding needed for extra patrols statewide. So th that's... Because that's, you're going to need them. We're going to need them. We need them now. Yeah, we're already well, dealing that's with That's right, because you're dealing with... We're, we're right, dealing with the issue right, right, right now. Right across the border. That's you know, right. We're in Pawtucket now. It's a stone's throw to uh, right. Seekonk and Attleboro that's right, right here. That's right. So it just... Uh, Amazes me to think that, that people don't realize they talk about the money that's going to it's going to bring in, but on the other side of the coin is uh, what is what is the other cost to it? Well, so that's a political uh, issue. issue. I try and stay out of those minefields <laughs> as best I can. Oh, now, now, now you now do. I do. Now I do. Now you're back. That's right. I had to switch gears <laughs> again. Again, um, but the bottom line: it, my job is public safety. Right. So if the General Assembly legalizes marijuana, then right. I have to deal with it. Even if they don't legalize it, I still have to deal with it. Right, because even if they don't, you still got to deal with Massachusetts and Connecticut. That's and, right. And maybe some of the other states around us, That's right? correct, yes. I don't know. That, I don't know. Well, I guess I already stated my opinion on it. But, but uh, so that ribbon there, what is that? I know the, the the top. This one. Yeah, the top thing above it is a sharp shooting thing. Right? Well, this is on the, this is my SWAT team pin. This one, the cross rifles. Now, what's this, what is that from? Yeah. Uh, I was on the SWAT team for 14 years, so um, I was a team commander four years on the team, 10 years on top of that. This is called the Division Service Ribbon. Um, it. I was involved in a shooting on the highway in 1991 um, as a young trooper, and uh, I received this uh, this ribbon here. So it was an honor to get that. Wow. But not about me. Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about the trooper that just got the service ribbon, uh, uh, Detective Connor O'Donnell. Who's the son of my guest from last week. That's right. He, um, he received the service ribbon, which has been given out 25 times since 1925. Wow. And um, Detective O'Donnell was at the uh, uh, nightclub, at the, sh the um, shooting at the country festival in Las Vegas in November of 2017. Really? He was there with his girlfriend off duty, and uh, 58 people were killed, over 400 injured, a thousand plus rounds were fired into oh, the crowd. Yes. 22, 23 rifles by one shooter. 
the worst mass shooting in the history of the United States. Right. Detective O'Donnell was there, off duty. That's and, unbelievable. And he rescued many people. Um, he did a very brave act. Um, he, he, he could have easily just run out of the sure. stadium, but he didn't. He ran out, brought his girlfriend, and ran back in several right. times. He saved a couple of people. Uh, uh, one person died uh, that he tried to save. And the, the Rhode Island State Police just gave him the service ribbon um, last Thursday. It was, it was you know, I didn't even make the connection, him yeah. being the son of Steve, former Colonel Steve right. O'Donnell. Right. I mean, I see the name, but it's not an uncommon name. It's O'Donnell. not an uncommon name, right. Not, I, not until a, you said it, I didn't make the connection right. to him. And it, even when he was here, he didn't mention it. You know. yeah, his son's a very sharp young man and was well-deserved of that honor. Well, your, your wife uh, must go crazy when you go out with all the things you've been done doing in your life. My wife doesn't worry. She doesn't worry. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't worry. <laughs> no. and what do you have? You have two kids? I have two children, yes. A boy and a girl, right? Right. Be- I saw your daughter. She's a beautiful yeah. girl. Yeah. Uh, your son wasn't there, but... My son graduated West Point a year ago this week. He's uh, in the Army as a second lieutenant, field artillery. He's in the 1st Armored Division, and he's in Korea. Wow. Station in Korea, and my daughter is a uh, started her junior year at Boston University. Oh, so you've done pretty good. They they get their brains from their mother. <laughs> and the bronze from the their looks, dad. In the looks. In the looks. In the well, looks. they definitely yeah, got the look. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to say that. Yeah, the but, looks. Uh, yeah, sure. They definitely got the look yeah. from the mother. That's a good thing for that, that one. Well, we got some great pictures of you during your swearing in as the, the new uh, superintendent of the state police, and we're going to go through them a, a little bit. Sure. And Great. the one picture uh, that I like, well, I like them all. I, I picked them out. So I, first of all, I shot them, as you know. Yeah. But uh, I picked out, uh, I think there's like 14 pictures that I picked out. And there's a picture of you with mom. Well, not with mom, but your mom at the top of the stairs. Right. And this was right in the rotunda of the state house, right. as you well know. And line with state troopers all the way up. And they, they parted like the Red Sea. And at the top of the stairs is your mother. Yep. In, right? Um, very great. She's been a wonderful mother, and she was very proud that day. I'm sure she was very proud that day. Yeah. I was proud just having, just knowing you. That's why I got there, and I said, wait a minute, nobody's taking the pictures here. Let yeah. me get... No, you, you did me a big favor on that one. That's a good one. No, it was an honor. It was a great day. For, oh, yeah. It was a great day for me, obviously, but it was a great day for Rhode Island and the state police. Now, what's the passing of the flag? What's that all about? That's a military tradition that, um, so when there's a change of command, Right. So there's a guide on, a flag that represents the, the, the unit you're in. And uh, we represent, you know, whether we're down state police, we have our own division flag. Right. And the, the deputy superintendent who was filling in as the superintendent before I got there, he was in charge. So he presented the flag to me to change command of the state police. Okay. That's what that was. All right. Then, then let's think now. There was a picture of you uh, being sworn in by the governor. That's right. Um, and help me out here now. There was another photo of you, uh, of, of your wife. Oh, you hang, hand in the roses to your wife. Or the, flowers, the flowers. The flowers to my, my wife. And your daughter. My daughter and my son's, son's girlfriend, girlfriend was there, right. right. Wonderful girl. Yeah. Yep, it, was, uh, it was a memorable day. Those, I, you showed me the pictures. They're beautiful pictures. Thank and, you. Thank and you and there was a, a, you're very welcome. There was another photo there I thought was uh, apropos uh, all of, well, at least several of the former colonels of the... That's right. Right? Yes, yeah, so Colonel Culhane came, Colonel Parry, right. Colonel Doherty, Colonel O'Donnell, and Colonel Sumpico. Right, and um, uh, Doherty, he, uh, was he, what, Master of Ceremonies, I guess? Or at least he was, opened, he was the he MC. Opened, he, he was the Master yeah. of Ceremonies, yes. He and I are close, and um, he, he's, he's, he's treated me well over the years. And yeah, I'm, I'm very... Um, I'm very thankful to all those superintendents. I mean, I worked, Colonel Colhane proposed me to corporal, um, Colonel Parry promoted me to sergeant, Colonel Doherty to lieutenant, <laughs> Colonel uh, O'Donnell to captain and then major in one year. Right. And then Colonel Sumpico was, you know, came on out, you know, became, right. so I didn't work for her, I worked with her. That's right, right, right. You were just leaving when she came on, right? Uh, I was leaving when, we, well, she came on 1992, I came on 1990. But she became the superintendent. No, no, after that's what I, I meant. When she kept I the left. superintendent, that's what I meant. Not when she came on. No, no, because she, right. she was there quite a while too. Right. And uh, so you didn't 
deal with it. But who, there was one guy there that I didn't recognize. Maybe that had been. Who was the first guy you mentioned? Colonel Culhane. He Maybe. was there in 1990 to 1999. He was, was he standing up? He might have been standing. The rest of them were sitting down in that first row. Um, I think he was sitting down. He was sitting down, if you're facing that row, to the far right. Okay. Well, I, well he's, he it had to be him because I, I recognized all the other people there. But I didn't recognize that, that man. But I took a picture of him anyway. He did. I took pictures <laughs> of everybody. Everybody that was I thought would have been uh, a part or interest, of interest to you. In fact, you know what I was really amazed at? And wait, you see him because you haven't seen these pictures. The pictures of the reception line after. Yeah, I want to see that. You went up. They went up to the uh, the governor's room, uh, the main uh, reception room for the governor. That's where you had the like the receiving line. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine this, folks, if you've been in the state house, from over here to the to the right, when you walk in that uh, governor's room, you were over there uh, underneath the, the George Washington picture, I think it is. That's right. Right, and the line went from there, it snaked out the door, it went to my left, and it went around, and it went around by the Senate, and the line was going around all the way almost to the house before wow. it stopped, yeah. Like a wake. Like a wake, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was a rebirth is what it was. That's right. It was your rebirth. Yeah. That Colonel, Colonel James Manny's rebirth, yeah. right? It was, it was a nice day. It was a wonderful, ex wonderful day. It had to be a long day for you. It was long. <laughs> and yeah. the first time I put my uniform on in three and a half years. And, uh, it, what it was, if it didn't fit? Well, I made sure it fit. I Did tried it? it on piece at a time. Oh, all right. I had to yeah. lose 10 pounds, but it fit. It was the uniform I came on with in 1990. Cut it out. It was the uniform I retired in, in no, 2015. No, I don't believe that. that was and it. then I came back. Cut it out. That was the uniform you started with? 1990. Wow. It was a little tight. A little tight. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, there's no way that I could have done that. And you not, could do not it. A you, chance. Look, you look great. You could <laughs> do it. <laughs> no, no way. No way. <laughs> <laughs> well, any other initiatives that you want to talk about? Or? Um, no, I think, uh, you know, the, I'd just like to go over, you know, the culture of the state police. So, okay. the, the, once again, the state police was founded in 1925, very tradition-based organization. Uh, we still wear the uh, beautiful uniforms. I went right. to uniforms with the boots and breeches, which is world renowned. World War One. Our first colonel was a field artillery officer. Red is the color. That's why we wear the red. Oh. Um, but it's a uh, it's a tradition based um, organization. Our motto on our hat, my hat says, "In the service of the state," and that's the state police motto. Right. And I think that best sums up the state police that we have a dedicated group of men and women. Uh, to public service, and um, they serve the people of Rhode Island. The, the state police belong to the people of Rhode Island. They don't belong to me. Right. And and we we strive uh, to keep the integrity and and the satisfaction that people have for their state police. And uh, people recognize this hat. They do. Everywhere. In fact, uh, was it uh, uh, Letterman that uh, dubbed the Rhode Island State Police as the 1986 best, Rhode Island State dressed? Police was the best dressed state troopers. Yes. Yeah. We, it, the people of Rhode Island treat the Rhode Island State Police with tremendous respect and dignity, and, and that, the, that motivates our troopers. They, they know the people of Rhode Island, revere them, and, and we revere them. Um, so that's why we have a very loyal group of men and women that serve the people of the state. That's why that's, that, that model, in the service of the state, is sure. the perfect model. Simple, and it's exactly what... How many state police? Well, right now, we're down. There's 224 state troopers, sworn state troopers, but we have a class coming on June 28th with 37 additional state troopers. So we'll be in the 260 something range, right. which, which will be good. We need them. All right, well, I, I like to see them on the highway, but I don't like to see them behind me. You know, <laughs> you don't, you don't, do you get nervous when you look in the rearview yeah. mirror? Who does it? I, I still do. Who, right? Yeah. Who does well, Of course you it's, do. It's, How could you not? It's the behind you. Well, yeah. What is he doing? Yeah. Well, well she, he or she, what are they doing behind <laughs> me? Did I do something wrong? Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Did I cross the line? Yep. It happens. It happens. Well, I'm glad you could make it by to spend part of an hour with Bob anyway. No, I would not have missed it. I did, did, you know, you're, uh, you're a commodity in Rhode Island, so we, uh, it's an honor to be here talking to you. Thank you for having me.
Well, and I hope you appreciate the photos, and I hope you, oh, you, I hope will. you enjoy them. I hope will. your wife I will. enjoys I, them. I, I, I'm sure I will, because I do not have a lot of photos that day. It was obviously a very, very hectic day, very busy. Well, you got a lot of photos. Thank uh, you, Bob. Probably 100. That's nice. Or more, is that's what I'm told, because uh, Diane looked at them, and I think there's, it's got to be 100, because I'm, I'm pretty quick at the, <laughs> the thing. You're pretty good. Well, well thank Colonel, you, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you. I Colonel James it. Manny, Rhode Island State Police. We'll be right back with Rob Cody from Warwick. Listen to radio, you'll hear about him or you'll hear from him, I have over the years, from Warwick, Rob Cody. He's the taxpayer's, uh, what would you call Great yourself? Watchdog, right? Well, I just try to pay attention to what's going on in uh, my community that I've been in for 59 years. All uh, right, a little bit about Rob Cody. What do you do for a living? Well, uh, right now, uh, for the past 25 years or so, I, um, I'm a structural steel inspector, CWI certified welding inspector, and I perform non-destructive testing on structural members, steel, high-rise buildings, power plants, bridges, and so forth. I actually started uh, my career years ago as a scuba diving instructor. Um, and then I became a commercial diver where I was doing underwater inspection. So when they say, hey, did you start at the bottom? I actually you, started, you started below, the bottom. The, below, below the, bottom. the bottom. Now, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Warwick. Um, I had a business in Warwick for 30 years teaching diving, and then I got involved into uh, the structural steel non-destructive non inspection business. Above the water? Above the water. And at that point, I could have gone to fly aircraft or wow. go inspect buildings. I'm not sure whether I made the right decision, but it pays the bill. Now you obviously have to you have to go up in the buildings. These uh, oh yeah yeah buildings these structures power plants. With, with no floors in them and stuff. Oh yeah yeah it's inspecting the raw steel. We uh, my job is code compliance to make sure that the building is built in accordance with the applicable engineering codes. Right. And the steel portion of it, the not structural the structural steel portion. Correct. Right. So I work as a consultant for a number of third-party independent testing labs. Um, so we do high-rise buildings, uh, Harvard MB. Uh, um, MIT, lots of lots of structures in Boston, uh, bridge inspection. So you are all over New nature. England. All over New England. Yeah, I was at the World Trade Center in New York City for a period of two years. When uh, was that? Uh, that was uh, when they were doing the Port Authority Transportation Hub in 2013 and 14, and um, I was tasked with inspecting all of the ornamental structures. So it was it was kind of fun. So it's it's been good. It's it's paid the bills, and um, you know it's uh, I've, I've been able it's been able to afford me a lot of free time right. that I could spend with my kids to make sure that they got to their extracurricular activities. And what do you got for kids? I have two beautiful girls, um, lovely, talented little girls that um, I really want to watch them um, watch them grow up. They're 21 and 18. And I'm hoping that they'll be with me um, and share some grandchildren with me, which is <laughs> one of the reasons why, you know, I've been a thorn in the side of oh, the city That's what we're going to get to. That's right? what I was going to get to, yes. Because uh, at the track that we're going, it, Warwick's going to be unaffordable, and my beautiful little girls are going to move away from me. And right. at that point, um, I'm, a, I'm an angry taxpayer now, but... When It'll my bills a, move away, terribly, I, uh, I pity, ferociously angry. I pity bit. the politicians that don't do the right thing. Right. So, what is going on in Warwick right now? Well, you know, you just had a change of administration. We had a change of administration, Bob. As you know, Mayor Avedisian was there flew for the what, coop. nineteen years. Uh, nineteen years, and then um, all of a sudden, up and left. He became uh, the head of Ripta, right? Yeah, and interestingly enough, you know, I questioned Go um, Governor Raimondo a couple weeks ago on the Jean Valicenti show because she said, well, you know, we have all these cities in town in fiscal peril because their mayors were so fiscally inept and, and, and basically destructful. Yet the one that did the most damage, she hired him and appointed him as the director of RIPTA, Scott Avedisian. Now, wait a minute. You, when you say he did the most damage, what do you mean he did the most damage? Warwick right now is on the brink of bankruptcy and catastrophe. Well, I haven't heard that. I hear other cities. I, I hear uh, different cities other than Warwick. I don't hear Warwick. Pay attention to the news in the coming weeks. Okay. Warwick is in, in incredi incredibly bad shape. We have unfunded liabilities through the roof. We're never going to be able to pay for them. Um, we have 
taken all of the last 15 years data and former Councilman Cushman who's a brilliant financial analyst has plotted all this on uh, some wonderfully colorful graphical charts and it shows one. that you where, where go you, yeah you have one right you, you, sent you me look one. at the look there at the fire right department chart. Right? now now this is i didn't get a chance to look at this a fireman's budget analyst now what mm -hmm. is this about you well this just goes this to, to show you know in 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 since 2004 to present what the cost has gone to per firefighter when you factor in the annual uh, fees of the OPEB costs and insurances and things of that nature when right. you put the whole package together you know your, your fees have oh, gone from a hundred and thirty four thousand dollars per man to two hundred and seventy one thousand dollars per man I see that yeah right we can't afford it anymore Bob now, does anybody look at this like you look at this no and, and you know putting this together like per cost per fireman based well, on all these Cost. No, the the city hasn't done that, and and, and frankly, um, you know, n no disrespect to them to the members of the city council, they don't have the skills to do this. It takes a certain set of skills to do this. It takes a certain mindset to be able to go through documents and find trends where you have financial discrepancies and then dig through that. And it takes an enormous amount of time. I can tell you hundreds and hundreds of hours to find things and, and for example let's let's just talk about what opened the door right the unused sick pay of of the fire department fi oh, fi well, still unused on the sick fire. pay. okay right? so how it works is that the firefighters are allotted 20 sick days per year right they accumulate that in the first seven years to 140 sick days right once they reach 140 that's in the bank they still receive 20 sick days per year and out of the 20, whatever they don't use, they get to monetize it. Now, up until 2012. You mean cash them in? They get to cash them in. So they used to be able to. At 100%? No, they used to be able to cash it into 50%. Right. Right? So they could maximize 10 days or 50% of what was unused, the maximum of what they did not use. Right? Right. So uh, up until 2015, if you had perfect attendance and you didn't have any sick days, you could cash in 10 days. In the 2015 contract, the firefighters did two things. They bumped, it, it used to be actually 120 days, then they bumped it to 140 in the bank. But in 2015, they increased the payout to 75%. At that time, the city council, uh, they never looked at that. The finance director at the time, Ernie Zalimsky, authored a um, fiscal note on the, on the contract, which was falsified. I challenged him at the budget hearings because he had said that the impact on this increase of unused sick time over three years would be $211,000. Wow. Over three years. Well, I challenged him on that. Per? That is for the cost of all the firefighters right. over three years, the line item would increase $211,800. Wow. Okay? So, the premise of my challenge was this year you paid out 443000 You're increasing that by 50% for the next three years. Well, it's another two and a quarter, two hundred and forty. Two hundred and twenty-one thousand five hundred dollars yeah. the following year. So I said, your numbers are wrong. You're saying it's two hundred and eleven over three years. Your numbers are dramatically wrong. Well, in fact, he was proven wrong because the unused sick pay went from four hundred and forty three thousand to one million ninety two thousand four twenty one. In how much time? One year. The finance director was off with his numbers wow. by six hundred and forty-nine thousand dollars in one year. In one year, so when I looked at that, to me, it was a calculated, orchestrated, um, falsified fiscal note that was designed to disguise these numbers and these expenses. Okay, yeah, and it's got to show up somewhere. You you found it. Right, I found it. Nobody else found it. Scott Avedisian claims he had no knowledge, but we're going to get to that. So, so how I looked into this, Bob, I started getting the annual unused sick pay report, which, which is these documents right here. And I started seeing, uh, I should have highlighted this, I started seeing men getting the same exact pay, $3,939.30. This was what they would get at the end of the year. And I saw a lot of the this same This is their numbers. payout? Payout. Of the 10 days? Of whatever amount of sick days they didn't use. Okay. okay? 
So I started looking at this, and they're all getting the same amount, 39, 39, 30, right? So I said, well, wait a minute. Let me see what's happening. And at this point in time, these guys are all being paid for perfect attendance. But right. then what I did, I said, there's just no way that everybody's having perfect attendance. These guys are all getting the exact same amount of money. So I requested to see what is called the sick pay sheets, which I, I can show you what the sick pay sheets are. I have some of those as well. This is what the sheet looks like. Right. And after going through those, I found that all these men that got the exact same amount of pay, they all had different amounts of sick days that sure, they had taken. Sure, which means that shouldn't be the same. Right. So out of that, there was one man on the department that had perfect attendance. Only one? One. Had perfect attendance. And how many? He uh, got the same pay as over a dozen other guys that took up to eight sick days. Right? So the math didn't add up. So I started to look deeply into it. And I started to do this. Um, I, I got tons and tons of documents. And I actually plotted their, their, uh, their entire year's attendance records. And then I started getting attendance records, which are called accountability sheets, which I have here. And I started seeing that these numbers were being manipulated. And it was clear that they were being manipulated. And I performed some simple mathematics, and I, and I kind of figured out how, but I needed to get a document. So to make a long story short, because this has been well reported in the news, after, after some pressing and getting some press on it, <clears throat> we find out that there was actually the secret side deal agreement that I sent to you. Yeah, I, right? I, I want you to explain that to me. That, so, that's this paper, right? So what happened was when the contract was ratified and brought before the city council, they said, right. hey, we're going to have an increase of 25, of, of from 70, 50% to 75% on this line item. What happened after that <clears throat> is there was a mathematical formula, I won't get into the details of it, that the fire department manipulated to carry over that extra, whatever the guys didn't get paid for, they would carry that over and put it back in their bank so they could monetize an extra five days. So in essence, instead of getting paid out 75%, they got paid out 100%. 100%. Right? But the genius of this scheme was that it didn't work unless you called out sick, right? So when you called out sick, it did two things. It gave you the opportunity to have a residual payment put in your bank, and it also gave the opportunity to your buddy to come in and cover you at time and a half. Ouch. So this is how things skyrocketed. So what we found was this illegal side deal that was signed by Fire Chief Ed Armstrong, the union president, Bill Lloyd, and Scott Abadesian's lawyer, Peter Ruggiero. And it was signed on Warwick Fire Department Union letterhead that was in 2013. 2013. 2013. 2013. So the scheme began in 2013. At the time I discovered it, I only had data from 2015 forward. Well, the result was that we found that, that, that this agreement to pay them over and above what they were supposed to get paid, which was ratified right. through the legal process, was never brought before the city council was never entered into the tentative agreement, was not entered into the fiscal note, and was never brought before the public and the city council. It's completely illegal by state law and by city law, by city charter. So <clears throat> that's the fundamental of what was going on in the city of Warwick, right? So subsequent to finding the secret side agreement, I actually found, because through access to public records, somebody goofed, and they actually sent me the secret instructions on how to scheme the money no way. that went from the fire chief to the bookkeeper. And as you can see, the handwritten notes in here on how they actually will, will scheme 25% of a day. Here's the math right here. And add it back into their Now, this wasn't supposed to be sent to you and somehow no. it got sent to you? Correct. So, so you have the secret side deal. Right. That the fire chief signed. By the, the way, formula of the secret side. And deal. by the way, interesting enough, the fire chief used to be the union president. So the fire chief in, who was the former union president, and the current union president with the mayor's city solicitor signed this in the absence of the city council. And then they authored the secret instructions on how to scheme the money and then began paying this money out through electronic wire transfer. So what I did, I got and all... Why is, what's the purpose of electronic wire transfer? So there'd be less, less of a um, 
Well, no, as, 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 you, know, as you know, if, if two or more people engage in, type, in some type of monetary it's scheme, federal. and that scheme is paid through electronic wire transfer, it's, it's a violation of federal law. Right. That's right? Right. Federal hence, wire fraud. Hence the FBI. I would think. Because so, I'm hearing rumor that the FBI are in Warwick. Is that true? I'm hearing the same thing. And as a matter of fact, Councilman uh, Marola, the council president, admitted that he has been questioned by the FBI. He did say that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So now we have many years' worth of these documents from the city. And what we did was we found out how many men uh, got paid, how many sick days they took, how that many they, they were, actually took? That they took, how many unused days they were paid for, and how many of those days were overpayments. And I broke it down per man, per year, for 2015 to 17. And to the penny, and my numbers are extremely accurate, I've been very good in math my whole life, <laughs> there was $247,850.60 that was wrongfully dispersed because of the secret side deal. Wow. Now, that only is from 2015 Two to years. 17. We still have to account for the balance of 2018, and we have to go back to 2013, April, when the scheme began. Yeah. So if you just take these numbers and you get an average per month, and then you take that number and you add the same amount of 26 months, it comes up to $437,500, give or take a percent or two, of monies that were wrongfully taken from the taxpayers of Warwick. Wow. It's a lot of money. It sound, yeah, of course. We're talking a million dollars, right? You're talking a million dollars a year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. on that line yeah. item. Yeah. Now, by the way, and I, you know, and I should have brought that, but I didn't. Um, I can send you a graphic, though. All of this, this million-dollar line item, is calculated on pencil and paper handwritten sheets. It's not on a spreadsheet. It's right. not on electronic media. It's pencil and paper handwritten sheets for a fire department of 220 men. When you look at these sheets, there's eraser marks all over them, there's notes, there's we carried over this day, we forgot, it, it, it's, it's atrocious. It's absolutely atrocious, the way that they're doing it. Tell me something, when you go back, and this is just to, probably to add to it, you probably already thought of it anyway, somebody, you, you're saying you can carry over, what, what'd you say, a year, for up until 140, what do they carry, 20? 20, and whatever you don't use, the All balance right. you can cash in at 75%. Okay, 20, you can carry up to 140. That said, goes right? in the bank. So 20, seven years you can carry, right? Right, and by the way, once you meet that 140, you're getting that paid in your first seven years on the department, right, as you're a private. That's what I was going to say to you. You get to cash that 140 at, at out at the end of your career at when whatever, when right. whatever rate. That, that was going to be my question yeah. to you. In other words, it's like saying somebody's getting minimum wage seven years ago, and mm -hmm. now they're making forty dollars an hour, and you got to cash them out at forty dollars an Correct. hour. Correct. Even what's though, happening. even though the first twenty hours that were when they were at minimum wage, and the second twenty, you know, second year they were at a little over minimum Correct. wage, and on and on, it, it isn't like stepped up, right? Correct. It's paid off at it's the top. Paid off at the top when they retire. It's kind of what happens with the they. They go on disability when they're a captain or right. a lieutenant. So in essence, what happens is you get paid the whole boatload. You get paid the whole boatload. We just can't afford it anymore, Bob. It, the money's not there. So, so interestingly enough, I brought this to Mayor Solomon's attention as he, when he was on the council with five other councilmen three years ago in April of 2016. So Mayor Solomon finally stops this at the end of May in 2016. In 18, right? So now, through public records, I, w I go and I get all the documents of all the handwritten sheets, and I calculate all the number of sick days, right? What we find is, prior to the mayor stopping the unused sick pay scheme, we had a certain amount of sick days on average. Right. As soon as he stopped it coming June 2018, the number of sick days doubled. So what they're doing now is... They're to make it another way. That, exactly. So now they have contrived a sick-out scheme, a revolving sick-out scheme, to drive overtime costs to get back the money that we found. Now, now, I am not saying that out of conjecture because I know I'll get crucified. I have all of the hundreds of documents to substantiate wow. everything that I'm saying to you. Wow. 
So it's deplorable, and it's been allowed to happen, right? So for years we've had uh, members of the city council that have turned their back to this for political gain. Scott Avedesian had the city council in his back pocket with the exception of maybe two members. And, uh, you know, we've had people on the council that unfortunately just are not educated enough to even be able to understand these types of things. Uh, they don't understand the budget. Uh, in 2015, walking into the ratification of the contract, I personally questioned six members of the city council who openly admitted to me that they never read the contract. Wow. One of the council members said to me, why would I waste five minutes of my time reading a contract that I was not part of the negotiating team? And I said, because you're signing it on the part of your constituents. All right? It was ignored. So now all of a sudden, Scott Avedesian has taken the new role of Sergeant Schultz on Hogan's Heroes. I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> I knew you were right? going to say that. Yeah. I see nothing. I know nothing. He won't talk to the press. He won't go on camera. And the city is finding out we're at the edge of the fiscal cliff. All right, so that's the unused sick time scheme. Let me give you another scheme. We had a situation of unused vacation time. So uh, up until I think it was 2012, you could accumulate a certain amount of vacation time would go on the bank. When you retired, if you hadn't used it, you got paid out. Right. Right. So I started looking at that because everyone was getting paid out the maximum of unused vacation time. Which is what? What is the maximum? I think it was 24 days at the time. But <clears throat> Again, at the highest rate. At the highest rate of pay. But what I found out was in the 2015 contract, in the tentative agreement, there was no notation of increasing unused vacation payout. So the unused vacation days, it was paid out. Your day was one-fifth of a week. So, for example, if you made $1,000 a week, right. your day was worth 200 bucks. Right. right? There, was, there was no documentation of increasing that in right. the tentative agreement, and it wasn't in the fiscal note. So the contract was ratified per the tentative agreement. When the contract came back, it goes to the fire chief and the union president to take those changes and actually put them on paper for the historical record. And what they did, they switched the one-fifth of a day's pay to one-fourth of a day's pay. Oh. So they so increased. Two fifty. Two right. Two hundred becomes two fifty. Exactly. So they increased. I'm pretty good at math too. Right. They <laughs> increased the unused vacation pay by twenty five percent without telling anybody. So in the three year period that was a hit of hundred thousand dollars that the taxpayers took. So we got four hundred and thirty seven dollars in there. Now we get another hundred thousand, so we're five hundred over five hundred thousand dollars. I brought that to everybody's attention. Um, to this day, we haven't seen any action on that. So I started looking a little deeper. And they must love you down there, huh? The, the fire department. Yeah, well, I'm on the I'm on the hit list, but uh, on the hit list. Yeah, you know because everybody thinks that I do this because I have some axe to grind with the fire department. Well, I was going to ask you that. And, yeah. and I don't, right? This is not about personnel. This is about policy. Let's make that straight. Uh, my mom, for years, suffered with a lot of illnesses. And the war fire department, the skill set is the best in the business, right? And these guys were there for her all the time. And I've interacted with lots of them. I trained a lot of the firemen back in the day when I owned my scuba shop. They're right. phenomenal people. They're highly skilled. And we're, we're grateful to have them. However, you cannot use the fact that the community needs you to hold us hostage right. and, and, and in, in this case, embezzle monies from the taxpayer when, when we can no longer afford. I, I, we're constantly told, told, and certain city council members during budget hearings would always say, while they had an active group of union members at present, that they deserve this and they deserve that benefit. You know what? Nobody deserves anything, Bob. You deserve Good. only what the community can afford. That's true. Okay? That's true. The needs That's of the true. many exceed the needs of the few. Yeah. And because that logic hasn't been implemented in the city of Wark, we're going over the cliff. So one of the other things I looked at, this bit of uniform allowances, right? So okay. this is what we call um, uh, compensation that, that's, uh, that's with that, that that's nobody really knows about, right? It's compensation on the side. It's, it's not on the salary line item. It's, it's kind of like hidden compensation. So with our uniform allowance, we find that we're giving each fireman $1,450 for uniform allowances. However, 
That was $1,035,000 over the last contract period, three years. So was that for the whole contract period? Yeah. Not one penny of it's traceable. Not one penny. So that money is supposed to go for you to buy uniforms. Right. Except there's a clause in the contract that states if a firefighter's uniform becomes damaged, the city pays for it anyway. Right? Wow. So that money gets, here's your check, and that's it. So you blow the check on whatever. Whatever you want. You go, you go, go, on, go to Newport for the weekend. Who cares? Right. Yeah. So, so if you want to compensate them, be honest about it. So this is another hidden compensation right. line right. item. The point being, it's big money. Right? And now when you do that with police, fire, you're looking at millions of dollars. So what's the appropriate way to do that? The appropriate way is, look, we give them their rollout gear, their turnout gear. We supply them with their dress, dress uniforms. We supply them with their everyday uniforms and their equipment. If they rip them or damage them on the job, we buy them anyway. There's no reason to have right. this line item at all. And if that, that in fact, sense. was what you were going to do, what you should do is you hire a vendor, Joe's Uniform Service. The man damages his uniform. He brings his damaged uniform to the vendor. He gets it replaced, and yep. the vendor bills the city. This is real simple stuff, sure. right? Why aren't we doing it? Because we're going to give them another perk of a million thirty-five thousand, and that way we have the union vote in our pocket. That should be stricken. Um, we have fourteen holidays. Can you name fourteen holidays? The city of Warwick actually pays eighteen holidays, eighteen different holidays. Really? Right. That needs to go. We need to pay the federal holidays, like everybody else gets. Period. End of story. So things like this are just monies that are being expended that, that the, the taxpayer can no longer afford. What, what do you think of, of this uh, greenhouse uh, uh, rule um, for the firemen getting, getting after uh, 42 hours? Oh, the Evergreen hours. contract. Evergreen, I'm sorry, Evergreen. So, you know, there's multiple problems with that, Bob, the biggest of which is that the elected officials that were elected to protect the taxpayers turn their back on the taxpayers and curried favor with the unions. Uh, every mayor, except for the mayor of Warwick, by oh, the way, yeah. whose son is a state rep who voted for this stuff and direct, directly against his father, his, uh, Mayor Joe Solomon sent a letter to the governor saying he didn't appreciate this because it's going to have detrimental impact to the sure. city of Warwick. He didn't go to the meetings, but he sent a letter. His son voted for it because his son obviously wants to curry favor with the unions. Well, how about, uh, we, we got two minutes left. Well, how about Charlie Labati? What did he say? Take the beds out. <laughs> and that's what they should be doing. Look, when I work in the powerhouses, right, we work yeah. 24 on, 12 off, 24 on, 12 off. We don't get to sleep. Nobody should be sleeping at work, period. So they're not if on. Anybody else that sleeps at work gets fired, right? Correct. But, but, but Speaker Mattiello will have you think that these guys are on for 56 straight hours. That's what he said on the Tara Greeny right, show. Right. In a three platoon system, you work 24 on, you have two days off. 24 on, two days off. In the four platoon system that we have now, it's two 10 hour days, two 14, two 14 hour, hour nights, nights, four days off. Right. And you know what's done on those four days? They're, they go to their other job. Their other job or their other business, right? Right. Yeah. So we, can't, we just can't afford it anymore, Bob. The taxpayers yeah. are taxed out and, and we, need, we need some relief. So we're gonna have to bring you back another time because it's interesting stuff and as a taxpayer, we, pays a lot of money to the city of Pawtucket, even though, what, what do you think of the idea of separating the uh, fire department from the rescue squad? Should have been done a long time ago. Because people have said that to me numerous times. 78% of the runs in the city of Warwick are rescue runs. And why, uh, then why, why is a fire truck go with a rescue squad? Because it's counted as an additional run. Minimum manning counts on that as well as minimum apparatus. You've got to remember, minimum apparatus drives minimum manning, which drives overtime. Uh -huh. What, what do you think of taking the fire truck to the, go shopping? Well, I think you know what that is. Don't get me started on that. To take a million dollar rig to go buy a bag of popcorn kernels? We got that on video, right? How um, about this? How about they took the fire truck last week to go pay the cable bill? Wow. At Cox Cable at Warwick Mall. Take a half a million dollar rig. Well, think Unacceptable. about that, folks. And thank you, Rob Cody. Thank you for spending Always part of an hour Bob. with Bob. Thank you.